um, after that, you can we need to reduce uh, the time of the rotation because it's the you know the the professor Madonna. The next one's really quick. Okay. All right. So I'm sorry you have two talks from me. I'm really sorry if you can't understand my accent. Okay. I'd love to speak with a mid-Atlantic accent or a very nice English accent. Um, it's really a continuation of the last talk, okay? but a lot of this is theory and very, very little proof. Um, but what I want to do is try and stimulate people to think and think outside the box. Okay? Again, no conflict of interest. Sorry, I shouldn't go so quickly. Um, we're going to go through introduction and why I got involved in this. Uh, and There's a little bit of overlap, so I apologise in, in advance. Uh, and then really what the autonomic nerve system is, again, it's kind of a little bit of weird science at the moment, um, and what I found out and what the potential is. So, introduction. Uh, this, I think, is our understanding of human anatomy and how the nervous system works. Um, this is our solar system. Um, I really should have put a picture of a black hole up there, um, because I think it's very incomplete, our understanding, not of anatomy, but of how anatomy and how the human brain works. Um, it's kind of like quantum computers and quantum physics. Um, I've been reading some very, very interesting journals and papers recently uh, into the fact that they now think they'll never produce a proper quantum uh, computer. It's be possible to do it. Um, and yet there are billions of quantum computers uh, in the world. Uh, the human brain is the ultimate quantum computer. Um, anyone know about M-state metals? Cool, I have you all. That's great. So now I can bullshit and you have to believe what I say. <laughs> okay, so it, it comes into quantum theory. So we all know about, you know, if you, com if you code a computer, zero and one. And zero, and that's the options you have. It's either zero or one. And with quantum states and quantum physics, zero and one can exist at the same time. And that's the whole thing. So you get this paradigm shift in how things work. Uh, and pain is, is kind of like this in that we've really been dumbing it down and making it really, really simple. Um, the, the thing is, we don't really understand uh, what's going on in the human body, and especially in the human brain. Okay? We understand perfectly because the nerves are easy to see, they're easy to dissect, and they're easy to understand. There's a chemical reaction that goes on, and there's propagation, and there's electricity, and it's very, very simple. Um, but we're still finding structures uh, in the human body. I, I should have put up a different slide. I, I put this up because, um, believe it or not, they have found interstitial space. Is that a revelation or not? Uh, this paper was published about interstitial spaces. We've been using these planes for years for our blocks, uh, yet we've only just described, it's only been described in 2017. Okay? Uh, and likewise, what we're doing in terms of pain, it's not that new, but people are just using it uh, to publish. The other one I put up was the, uh, should have put up was the omentum uh, that was found. Can you believe it? Somebody found the omentum in 2016. And they published this as a new organ in 2016. Okay? Um, again, people like me come into systems like this and talking. Um, BS comes to word, um, but we won't talk about that. We all know that sympathetic activity works. And we, it's been described for years and years and years in terms of chronic pain states. And there's no doubt about it, chronic pain exists. Uh, and we're, it's a very, very tricky mechanism to overcome. Uh, and again, I think it's because we don't understand the real complexities associated with pain uh, in, in its full extent. Uh, we know that pain states are complex regional pain syndromes 1 and 2, cancer, vascular and visceral pain. Okay? And we know that they're, they're, they're mediated sympathetically. Uh, and we know that if we provide a block, we get two to three days of really good analgesia, and then you get a slight wind back up of the pain phenomenon in a chronic pain patient, right? Excuse me, you put some steroids in there, you might get a little bit longer, two to three weeks, and then they get a wind back up again. Yeah? Um, why I got interested in this was because of the tap block. Okay? And I know it's a little bit of repetition, but I'll try and make it new and make it a little bit different. When we did the original, thanks, that's gone. When we did the original tap block, um, we got two to three days of pain relief. Okay? Not six to eight hours. We thought originally the local anaesthetic was staying in the tap plane for two to three days. It's the only thing we could understand. We blocked the sensory afferents. You can only block them with local anaesthetic. The local anaesthetic has to be beside the nerve to provide the effect. Therefore, it has to stay in this plane for two to three days to get an analgesic window. Then we realised what we thought was the mechanics of the block was complete hokum, and it was extending up into the paravertebral space. 
so our lovely landmark based tap block uh, wasn't providing an analgesic window in the abdominal plane but rather moving back up into the power virtual space so all of these lovely papers and the 400 that have followed since uh, became broken because no matter where you put your local anaesthetic and no matter what machine you use and um, putting your local anaesthetic here doesn't have an effect in terms of analgesia here it has a minimal effect for six or eight hours because after that time point there is no local anaesthetic in your, in your abdominal plane. It's gone. It's washed out. The nerves are no longer retaining it. What's important is where it travels to. And this is what we talked about last time, the paravertebral space. And it's this point of action in the paravertebral space that becomes really important. We're fixated on these peripheral nerves. And we've completely forgotten the sympathetic trunk. Okay, we for years and years and years apologised to our patients when we got sympathetic blockade in our patients in whom weren't get, they weren't getting par or chronic pain blocks and light is back. Okay. This is a patient and I have permission to show this picture. It's a patient, a breast patient of mine who had a left sided paravertebral block for breast surgery okay, and she had an auxiliary clearance and she has what's called a... Oh, what's it called again? I've lost, lost. Yes, she's got, well, she's got more than horner. She's got an ipsilateral horner and she's got contralateral vasodilation. If you look at this line down the middle of her face, she's got a red face on this side, Harlequin syndrome. That's the word, sorry, Harlequin syndrome. And this is one of my first patients that I did a paravertebral block in. And I came out and I saw that and I went, oh, cool! <laughs> Camera, flash, flash, flash. And I went, oh, sorry. Okay, I'm really sorry that this has happened to you. I'm really sorry that you have a Harlequin syndrome, that you look stupid. Um, it looks really cool to me, but this is a side effect of the block. And I apologised profusely and I told her in a few hours she would return to normal, okay, and that this would change the way she wore, or this, this, this wouldn't be permanent, and that she wouldn't have any long term effects. Um, and I was thinking the sympathetic block is an inconvenience, it's a side effect of my paravertebral block, it's a side effect uh, of the block that I wanted to do, I wanted to block my sensory afferents. Sympathetic fibres didn't matter. And then I started thinking, <coughs> well, hang on a second. Our tap block uh, got three to four days of analgesia. Um, is there potential for the sympathetics to work in terms of acute pain? Could my landmark-based tap block with the extension to the bar virtual space or my QL or my erector spinae actually be producing a sympathetic effect in acute pain? Um, so being the diligent researcher, I went back into uh, PubMed uh, and I looked back at, in terms of acute pain and sympathetic nervous systems. I knew it worked for chronic pain, but what about acute pain? And there was very, very little. Okay, lots and lots of it, herpetic zoster uh, infection, uh, a small study uh, about a myocardial infarction, but very, very little in there. I looked then at paravertebrals and uh, evoked potentials and dermatomal spread and uh, heat and vasodilation in the anterior chest wall. Uh, and I found this paper from 1998 um, uh, and they said that yeah if you do this block um, you will get definitely get an analgesic effect um, and if you get a sympathetic block you potentially get a better effect because you're blocking all of the nerves that are going back to the CNS not just some of them and a light bulb went off in my head and hang on a second maybe our tap block is actually a sympathetic block as well Maybe if I do a chronic pain block and I get two to three days of analgesia, it's because I'm blocking the sympathetics, which I'm trying to get. And then after two or three days, you get to wind up again and the, local, and the blocks start causing pain. But maybe if we get a better block and get a long-term activation or deactivation of our sympathetic nerve system, we can get a better analgesic effect. Uh, and as you look at things, and you look at the papers that are coming out now, and you look at how paravertebral blocks are becoming popular, especially in terms of breast patients, we now know that at three months, at six months, at a year, the pain perceived by patients who have paravertebral blocks is less than those that get local infiltration in the wound. Okay? Um, even uh, the greatest regional anesthetist in, in Asia, Manish Karmarker, is saying that the quality of life associated with paravertebral blocks is better than those who don't get it. Now, in this paper, Manish, I did say that the analgesic difference uh, at six months and the development of chronic pain uh, was no difference between multimodal analgesia, uh, local infect injection or paravertebrals. Our data and most of the data that exists would say that if you do a paravertebral block at six months and at a year, you have about 30 th 33 times less chance of getting chronic pain. So different patient populations, different blocks. So for me, I was wondering, is this has been something that's been hiding in plain sight for years? Okay. Um, 
This is my typical patient. Um, you can see they have a lovely heart, low heart rate. They're perfectly saturated. I don't like 100%, you know. There's no such thing as perfection. And a lovely blood pressure, okay. Uh, and it's a balancing act, okay. Um, we're balancing, and this is what we're doing every day of the week. Every day of the week, we're looking at these parameters and we're saying, okay, I need to do an auxiliary nerve block for my forearm surgery. Um, I block all the sensory afferents. And that's where we stop. We don't think about anything else and we're very closed in. Uh, in effect, when we talk about acute pain and sympathetic and parasympathetic or sympathetic nervous system, it's about maintaining homeostasis. And likewise with our analgesia and our anesthesia, we should be trying to provide homeostasis for our, pain, for our patients. So let's quickly go through, very quickly, because it's really boring, uh, pain modulation. Um, we know that uh, pain is through inhibitory parasympathetic or excitatory sympathetic activity. And what we're trying to do is block these. The parasympathetic nerve system, um, it's the inhibitory, it's biphasic really in nature, okay, and it depends on which way part of it you get. Um, but it's really probably the, the inhibitory actually, action that's probably a little bit more important. Um, it does work centrally, but it has a huge effect in terms of the peripheral uh, innervation, especially of the C fibres. It has a very, very small effect on the A delta, but it has an effect. It's mainly uh, on the C fibres. Um, unfortunately, in terms of publications, there's very, very little there uh, to talk about this. Um, it is slowly but surely coming into effect. The problem is, when you start talking about vagus nerve stimulation, you're getting into very dangerous territory in terms of placing a needle or placing a stimulation device down on a nerve, uh, and it rightly frightens people. Um, so the research is going to be slow in terms of the vagus. Um, there is some work out there sorry, is in terms of its effect on inflammation in humans, but again, it's very, very small uh, and small numbers, and you can see uh, it's not very current in terms of its publications. That's from 2005. The sympathetic nerve system, probably a little bit better understood, uh, and definitely a little bit more um, research out there in, in terms of it. it. It is a bit of a quagmire uh, in that there's so many different centres involved uh, in the regulation. Uh, the main thing to take away from this whole slide is this little thing on the bottom, the pain matrix. Um, the pain matrix and the human brain and this quantum computer that we talked about in the beginning, this computer that we don't know how it works, um, works uh, in a very convoluted way through the pain matrix and we haven't completely identified how it's working. Um, and we won't do that until we understand quantum physics uh, a little bit better. But there's all these descending uh, pathways that have an effect. Um, and definitely, um, under physiological conditions, the sympathetic nervous system has an effect on both the A delta and C fibres. Okay? Um, what I'm going to say in a couple of minutes is going to be a little bit more uh, explanatory than this. Um, but we're using this every single day of the week in theatre, and we don't know it. Or we haven't woken up to the fact that we're doing it. Okay? Um, and like I said, if you block synthetic activity, you block the effect on the A delta and C fibres and also the release of the chemotactic factors uh, at the level of the boutons in the nerves. Okay? Um, again, remember, if I want one take-home picture is this here at the bottom, alpha-2 adrenal receptors. Okay? We know that this, in terms of periphery, in terms of sympathetic nerve system, that the end point is in the periphery and if we block the periphery properly and then we're going to get an effect. Unfortunately, uh, the most of the research that's out there is in animal models, okay? And we haven't done this in humans um, because we're not thinking about it. We're all thinking about the sensory afferents. We're not thinking about sympathetics. Like I said in the last talk, the reason the epidural fails is that we don't go high enough. We don't block that input. Remember, your sympathetic nervous system comes into the, into the chain. It can go anywhere. It can change over to the far side. It can go down before it inserts. It can also go up before it inserts. So if your local anesthetic isn't three or four levels above where it needs to be, okay, and you're not getting your patients needing respiratory uh, assistance, you're not going to get a full sympathetic block in this patient population. So let me prove how this works. Okay? Let me show you all of the research that's out there. Okay, this is Pedersen, a um, lovely paper. Um, and they looked at this in terms of acute pain, um, the sympathetic blockade, uh, and it failed. Yeah, and it really made me upset. So I was sure when I read the paper initially, there's going to be a big one. I said, there has to be more. Uh, so I moved on to this one by Choi et al. Um, and this was a stellar ganglion after um, arthroscopic surgery. Okay, so it was done before the surgery was performed. Um, so it's effects of Ulstein guide a stellar ganglion block uh, after arthroscopic shoulder. Uh, and it failed. Uh, and I became really, really upset. 
uh, and kind of wondered what was going on and why were we with the tap block getting an effect and these guys who were performing direct sympathetic activity, uh, nerve blockade weren't getting the same effect. Um, and I found this paper, uh, and it, or this little letter to the editor, uh, and it was kind of a, a saviour um, when you looked at what was happening. Uh, it was from 2005, and it was for a patient in the, in the PACU, or the post-anesthetic care unit, in whom they provided analgesia, they did uh, opioids, they did ketamine, they did everything, and they weren't getting good analgesic effect. And they said, look, let's just try this. And they did a stellic ganglion block, and here, presto, the pain was gone. Okay. They'd, I'm not sure, I don't think this patient got an interscaling block, um, but definitely post-op uh, patient's pain was treated with. So, being the good researcher and original researcher that I am, I stole his idea and I copied it. Um, and the idea was to go back to those people who said that we lied with our data in the beginning. Um, and we said, eventually, when we noticed the local anaesthetic was going to the paravertebral space, that the local anaesthetic was acting uh, in that space blocking sensory afferents, but more importantly, blocking sympathetic fibres. Remember our first papers, we got three to four days of analgesia. So again, this reminded me of the chronic pain physician, three to four days. When we started talking about this without research, people said that we were crazy. It doesn't work like this. Uh, it works by uh, getting local anaesthetic onto sensory afferents, and that's acute pain. Chronic pain is sympathetic. There's no change between, or no link between the two of them. I went back to my theatre and I noticed that lovely picture, heart rate 55, SATs 99, BP 95 over 52. And I said, this patient has no sympathetic activity. I know he's sore because if he's sore, he's going to get tachycardia. He's going to get hypertensive. They're sympathetic. <coughs> so in my theatre, I expect the patients to exhibit sympathetic activity if they're sore. But when I'm blocking them, I don't care about it and I don't think about it. So we changed what we did. And just to prove what was happening, oh, it's me, sorry, it's me that's causing that trouble. Um, we looked at this patient, a small case series, and I, it's not science, okay? This is not to prove it. This is just to show that it can potentially have an effect. We looked at four patients that came in with horrendous upper limb uh, insult, so humeral fractures. Um, we gave them a GA. We gave them a stellic ganglion block uh, with lignocaine 1% three mils of 1% or 2%. Um, we gave them intraoperative opioids, non-steroidals, and clonidine, okay? Um, the sympathetic, the blockade was very, very simple. This is from Michael Gofeld's paper. Um, this is my transverse process of T6. This is my longus coli muscle. There's a fascia overlying longus coli. The reason we're at T6 is if you go any lower, you get a big thing called vertebral artery, which people will, if they see it, they will hit it. Um, and they provided a block at this level, and the, the, the sympathetic chain lies in that fascial plane. Again, even though the fascial plane was only described last year, um, we were using it, uh, and you got a sympathetic block. And here's the patient population that we had. You can see the four patients, pretty horrendous surgery, um, or fractures, I should say, with pretty horrendous incisions. Um, there's the humerus coming up, and so you're looking at it like this, okay? Um, you can see there's quite a lot of metal work uh, being placed in this poor patient. Uh, quite a large incision, um, and then when we woke the patient up, this man was a fisherman. He was working on a trawler in the North Atlantic. He'd fallen on his elbow, uh, he'd shattered it. Um, when he woke up in the recovery unit, he had no pain. And we gave him a PCA, and not him, he was this patient here. They used no pain in the first 48 hours. Immediately post-op, he had full range of motion. The next day, because the hospital food was so good in our system, he demanded that his wife bring him in a steak, uh, which he cut with his, himself. At six weeks, the range of motion was better than those that had been blocked. The surgeons were delighted because there was no nerve involvement in terms of the, uh, especially these fractures here, uh, in terms of the radial nerve. Um, but post-operatively, this patient population had no pain. Okay? And we said, what's going on? How can this be important? How can the other papers have failed and this one not fail? Uh, the reason they failed is that you didn't have sympathetic wind-up. You didn't have the sympathetic nerves firing, so you couldn't block all the white dynamic response neurons that were coming in. What we described with this, and we've subsequently moved on to a randomized control trial, which we haven't finished, uh, is that if you have sympathetic wind-up and you perform a sympathetic block, you get an analgesic effect. Um, and uh, this will happen in this patient population. In the clinical setting, um, 
every day of the week. Sorry, I'm not sure it's me. In this clinical setting, we're using these drugs every day of the week. Um, and we're not thinking about where they're working. Remember we talked about the alpha-2 receptor, which exists on your nerves? Um, these, these nerves or these drugs work on that. They also work through the N-type vo voltage systems, calcium channels, um, and through um, the uh, B and C, or the A, A delta and C fibers. But their effect is on our alpha-2s. And we use these every day of the week without thinking of how they work. We think that they work perfectly, we think that they work centrally, and we're not thinking about them working on the sympathetic nervous system. Um, for me, like I said, this is just at the beginning of things. Um, definitely in terms of the way we're doing our blocks, I would now say that if you're doing a block, you need to block everything. If you want to get an analgesic effect, you need to block everything. Not just a little nerve or not just a sensory afferents. You need to block uh, the sympathetics as well. I'm missing a few slides, I'm sorry. Um, in my experience, parasympathetic and sympathetic activity do have a role. We're not going to go really near the parasympathetic, parasympathetics. And because um, they're so deep and so near structures that are dangerous, uh, so our probable only option is to impact on the sympathetics. Okay, um, definitely in terms of the real life situations, the substantial insult gets much better effect by sympathetic block than the ordinary sensory afferents, uh, or through small fibre uh, innervation. And um, but like I said, in terms of preemptive, it doesn't seem to have an effect at the moment. Um, what will happen? It won't replace PNS. Um, but it, instead of may, it should be an adjunct to it. Um, it should be something that you're trying to block all of the time, uh, not just some of the time. Um, unfortunately, as it stands in the moment, uh, there are no randomised control trials looking at this. It is something that's going to happen in the future. Um, and there are quite a number of centres looking at, especially the stellar ganglion block for upper limbs. Um, we potentially are looking at a simple, similar situation in the lower limbs. Um, but if it does work and you're getting 28, or 24, 48 hours out of analgesia out of a single shot technique, it's going to change the way we're doing uh, anesthesia. And before we all fall asleep, thank you very much. Yeah. What is the balance? Yeah, it is it. It's, it's that quantum computer thing. We don't know. Um, in effect, they work together. Uh, I don't think you can isolate one over the other. Um, and realistically, we don't know. Um, what you'd worry about with the vagal stimulation is all the other side effect profile associated with it, especially if you're in the neck. If you get the wrong patient population and you uh, cause um, innervation or denervation of the heart, then you're in trouble. Um, but in terms of where we're going, like you see, there's, there's no randomised control trials on this. Not one. Okay? There's a few case series. Unfortunately, um, paper never refused ink. Uh, and likewise, journals, especially if you pay for it, um, they won't refuse publication. Um, but proper clinical trials are required to provide proper uh, science on this. We don't know. Um, we're playing with this. That's all we're doing. Um, we need younger minds to come, the quantum computers of the future to come and show us what's going on here. Um, the sympathetic nervous system is easy to get at. It's relatively superficial. Um, even the stellate ganglion, uh, it's relatively easy to block. Um, we're doing sympathetic blocks every day, but we're not thinking about it. Um, using dexmethamidine, clonidine, they're sympathetic blocks, but we're not thinking about it as sympathetic block. Um, paravertebrals, epidurals, peripheral nerve blocks, they're all sympathetic blocks, but we're fixated. It's the problem is we're trying to reinvent the wheel instead of looking at what's there in real terms. The other problem is the education system. The education system has put a line between acute and chronic, and there's no marriage of the two. There's a wind-up phenomenon that occurs. Everyone hears about this wind-up phenomenon that occurs during surgery. It's not a wind-up phenomenon. It's just the fact that we're not blocking the sympathetics at all and they're working away in the background. Of course they're going to keep going. It's like a cancer. It's, the more you don't look at it, the more it's going to grow. Um, so in the right patient, you're going to get chronic pain. In the wrong patient and motivated patients, you're not going to get as much. Um, but definitely it's the fact that we're not thinking about this as being one system instead of it being 
three or four systems. So I'm so if you if you could prevent that wind up. Yeah. And surely you could prevent the problem, and therefore, why do you say that preemptive analgesia is a little or no benefit? Ah, okay. No, I, I, I don't think preemptive analgesia is not a benefit. I think preemptive sympathetic blockade oh, okay. is is of no effect. So this whole thing about preemptive analgesia being rubbish, I don't agree with it. I don't. I, I, I think preemptive analgesia is very important. Um, so I treat my patients with opioids. I treat my patients with non-steroidals. Um, it's it, what seems to be an effect, and it's not going to happen in everybody. But if you do a preemptive block on somebody who's having shoulder arthroscopy, for example, in terms of impact, it has no impact. Um, now, you get a patient in, like those patients in whom the shoulders are in bits or the humeruses are in bits, um, and you do a stellic ganglion block there and then, immediately the pain falls off. It doesn't get rid of all of the pain, but has a huge impact on the pain. Um, some of those patients we did, and remember again, people like me will lie through our eye teeth because we're thinking of the next conference we can talk about the same thing again. We don't get perfect analgesia. We're, I'm like you. I go to theatre and I get block failures. Um, I get patients in whom it doesn't work. But then you get one patient in whom it works and you know it's not placebo. You get a big, big fisherman who feels no pain, who's crying, who all of a sudden, despite the fact he's still got a fracture, is moving his arm. You know you've done something right. Um, and with the local that we're giving, we, we use three mils of lignocaine underneath that fascial plane longus coli. So there's no interscalene block. There's no epidural spread. If there is some blood spread in, 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 the, in the blood system, three mils in the whole body, you can forget about it. So it's the sympathetic blockade. It hasn't translated into randomized controlled trials. There was one paper from India, um, but it, there was a small flaw in the study, in that they didn't isolate it just to humor fractures. They went for carpal tunnels, they went for Dupuytron contractures, and so it weakened the study and the numbers are very, very small because of that. Um, but it is something that people should study. Um, but it's very, very simple to do. And what I'm trying to get people to do is just think a little bit outside the box. Don't think because somebody stood on a stage, either here or in med school, that that's the only way to do things. Um, you're all scientists. You're all alpha male and females, you know, um, you're high, you have to compete uh, to get into university, you have to compete to get on schemes, you have to compete to get jobs, and you'll, yet you won't challenge what's been said in papers, and that's a problem, it's a mistake. Go to www.ultradissection.com or info at ultradissection.com.